was Anthea Turner, the host of GMTV in 1995, when that interview was broadcast, speaking prophetically when she uttered those chilling words, you be the judge. He was a star on the rise, topping the charts and commanding the stage. But behind the glitter and glam, a sinister secret lurked. Unspeakable acts, shattered lives, a fall from grace that ended with him forever languishing behind bars, a shell of his former self. This is the disturbing true story of Gary Glitter. Born Paul Gad, he shot to fame in the glam rock scene of the 1970s with hit songs like Rock and Roll and Do You Wanna Touch Me? But as his star power grew, so did his predilection for the unthinkable. Over the decades, his crimes would catch up with him again and again. Arrests, conviction, prison time. Each time he thought he had escaped his past, it dragged him back down. Somehow, he always managed to finagle an early release, but no longer. Oddly enough, his sordid life at one point even inspired a bizarre TV drama, perhaps an effort to understand how a cherished star could possess such evil. Truth be told, though, nothing could rationalize the atrocities that this once-beloved public figure committed seemingly without any remorse. Now in his late 70s, Gary Glitter will likely spend the rest of his days rotting in a prison cell, which is a pretty fitting end for a man who caused so much pain and destruction. In this video, we'll dive deep into Gary Glitter's shocking story, the dizzying heights of his music career, the horrifying lows of his crimes, the repeated falls from grace, and the final justice of his incarceration early life and rise to stardom. Gary Glitter, born Paul Francis Gad on May 8, 1944, was a product of his time and place, growing up in the post-war era in the market town of Banbury, Oxfordshire. The England of Gad's youth was a nation grappling with the aftermath of World War II, characterized by social conservatism, economic austerity, and a yearning for change. Raised primarily by his young, unmarried mother and grandmother, Gad never knew his father, a reality that likely contributed to his unruly nature from an early age. The absence of a father figure may have also fostered a sense of insecurity and a need for attention that later manifested in his flamboyant stage persona. Growing up in the 1950s, the young Gad found himself drawn to the bright lights and vibrant nightclub scene of London, a world that stood in stark contrast to the quiet, conservative life back in Banbury. The capital city was undergoing a cultural revolution at the time, with the rise of youth culture, rock and roll music, and a newfound spirit of rebellion against the old order. For Gad, London represented an escape from the constraints of his small-town upbringing and a chance to reinvent himself in the image of his musical heroes. By the age of 16, Gad was already performing on stage in London clubs, adopting the stage name Paul Raven. His first big break came when a film producer spotted him and paid for a recording session with the prestigious Decca Records label, which had somewhat infamously turned down the Beatles just a year prior. In 1960, Raven released released his debut single, Alone in the Night, a romantic ballad that showcased his youthful crooning style. While the song failed to chart, it marked an ambitious start for the teenage hopeful and hinted at the determination and drive that would characterize his later career. Throughout the 1960s, Raven continued to work on the fringes of the British music industry, honing his craft and seeking out opportunities to make a name for himself. For a brief period, he was managed by noted producer George Martin, who went on to achieve legendary status for his work with the Beatles. However, Raven's singles with Martin failed to gain traction and his hopes for a breakout as a solo star began to stall. It was a time of great frustration for the young singer who saw his contemporaries like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones achieve massive success while he remained stuck in the shadows. By 1964, at the height of Beatlemania, Raven found himself reduced to doing warm-up slots for the popular TV music show Ready Steady Go, which featured top acts like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and The Who. It was a humbling experience for the ambitious singer who yearned for the same level of success and adoration as his peers. However, Raven refused to let these setbacks defeat him, and he continued to pursue his dreams with a single-minded determination. Undeterred by the challenges he faced, Raven persisted in his musical pursuits, performing with groups like the Mike Leander Show Band and Boston International. He even adopted different stage names, like Paul Monday, in an attempt to reinvent himself and find a new audience. 
However, as the 1960s progressed and music tastes shifted around him with the rise of psychedelia and progressive rock, major success continued to elude the struggling singer. It was a time of significant change in the music industry, and Raven found himself struggling to keep up with the rapidly changing times. But despite these struggles, Raven never lost his love for music or his belief in his own talents. He continued to write songs and perform wherever he could, honing his craft and waiting for his big break. It was during this time that he began to develop the flamboyant stage persona that would later become his trademark, experimenting with makeup, costumes, and stage effects to create a more eye-catching and memorable performance. As the 1960s drew to a close, Raven found himself at a crossroads. He had spent the better part of a decade trying to make it in the music industry, but success had remained ever elusive. Many lesser artists would have given up at this point, but Raven's determination and belief in himself never wavered. He knew he had something special to offer, and he was willing to do whatever it took to make his dreams a reality. It was at this point that Raven made the decision that would forever change his life. Recognizing the shifting tides in the music industry, he decided to reinvent himself once again, this time as a glam rock star. Glam rock was a new and exciting genre that was taking the UK by storm. Characterized by its flamboyant fashion, gender-bending aesthetics, and catchy, pop-infused sound. Artists like David Bowie and Mark Bolin of T-Rex were at the forefront of this movement, and Raven saw an opportunity to make his mark. In 1971, Raven unveiled his new persona, Gary Glitter. With his shiny silver suits, platform boots, and bouffant hair, Glitter was the epitome of glam rock excess. He was a walking, talking embodiment of the genre's over-the-top aesthetic, and audiences couldn't get enough of him. Glitter's debut single under his new moniker, Rock and Roll Parts 1 and 2, was an instant hit, reaching number two on the UK charts and even making waves in the US. The success of Rock and Roll was just the beginning for Glitter. Over the next few years, he released a string of hit singles, including I'm the Leader of the Gang, I Am, I Love You, Love Me, Love, Do You Wanna Touch Me, and Hello, Hello, I'm Back Again. These songs cemented Glitter's status as a pop icon and made him one of the most successful artists of the glam rock era. But Glitter's success wasn't just about the music. He was also a master showman known for his high-energy live performances and flamboyant stage presence. With his backup band, The Glitter Band, he put on shows that were as much about spectacle as they were about music. Glitter would strut and preen on stage, decked out in his trademark sparkling jumpsuits, his face caked in makeup and glitter. He was a larger-than-life figure, a walking embodiment of the excesses and indulgence of the glam rock lifestyle. At the height of his fame, Glitter was a true pop phenomenon. He sold millions of records, played to sold-out crowds around the world, and was a regular fixture on television and in the tabloids. He was a household name, a cultural icon whose image and music were instantly recognizable to people of all ages. But behind the heaps of glitter and glamour, there was a darker side to Gary Glitter. Unbeknownst to his fans, the singer was harboring a secret life as a predator, using his fame and influence to exploit and abuse underage girls. It was a shocking revelation that would eventually come to light, forever tarnishing Glitter's legacy and exposing the vile underbelly of the music industry. A Shocking Fall from Grace By the end of the 1970s, Glitter's once Midas touch was starting to lose its sheen. A changing musical landscape combined with his own ballooning ego and wild spending habits sent his career into a tailspin. In 1976, faced with declining record sales and mounting money problems, Glitter abruptly announced his retirement from show business and fled to France and later Australia. But the allure of the stage proved too strong. After two years in semi-exile, Glitter returned to Britain in 1978, plotting a comeback. He managed to score a few modest hits and stayed afloat as a live act, but his days as a chart-topping superstar were over. Financial troubles continued to dog him, leading to bankruptcy filings in both 1977 and the early 90s. Still, Glitter soldiered on as a popular, if diminished, concert draw. His glam anthems remained in high 
high demand with retro-minded audiences. He performed around 80 shows a year and even introduced a new generation of post-punk and alternative rock acts who grew up on his infectiously catchy singles. It seemed Glitter would be able to ride out a respectable career as an in-demand nostalgia act. Everything came crashing down in sickening fashion in 1997. Glitter became ensnared in a stomach-churning scandal after bringing his laptop in for repairs. A technician discovered thousands of explicit images of minors on the device's hard drive and alerted authorities. Police raided Glitter's homes in London and Somerset, uncovering a trove of indecent materials. In 1999, a disgraced Glitter pleaded guilty to possessing vast amounts of child pornography. He was sentenced to four months in prison and placed on the sex offender registry indefinitely. The news shocked Britain and destroyed Glitter's reputation overnight. He went from a beloved entertainer to a national disgrace, condemned as a shameful pervert hiding in plain sight. After serving two months behind bars, Glitter fled from the unrelenting hostility in Britain. He sailed to Spain on his private yacht, living in exile and trying to outrun his pariah status. But controversy continued to tail the singer wherever he went. In short order, he popped up in Cuba, Cambodia, and finally Vietnam, leaving a trail of troubling allegations in his wake. Glitter's twisted overseas odyssey reached its bottom in Vietnam. In late 2005, he was arrested in Ho Chi Minh City on suspicion of committing lewd acts with underage girls. Authorities had launched an investigation after receiving disturbing reports about the rockers' activities in the country. In March 2006, a Vietnamese court found Glitter guilty of obscenely sexually abusing two girls, aged 10 and 11. He was sentenced to three years in prison and added to the country's sex offender registry. Upon his release in August 2006, eight, Glitter was deported back to Britain in disgrace. The Vietnamese case cemented Glitter's global infamy as a notorious sex criminal and destroyed any lingering goodwill he had from his music days. However, the depravity of his offenses was still not known to the public fully. The worst revelations about the supposed leader of the gang were yet to come, as Britain was plunged into a reckoning with the sins of its erstwhile pop idols. Justice catches up. Glitter's forced return to Britain in 2008 after being released from prison in Vietnam was a bitter homecoming for the shunned singer. He was immediately placed on the sex offender registry again and subjected to close monitoring and strict limitations on his movements. At 64, the rocker was a shell of his former preening persona. In 2012, the long-suppressed truth about Glitter's odious history of underage abuse exploded into the open in the wake of another shocking scandal. Fellow British entertainment icon Jimmy Savile was exposed as a horrifically prolific sexual abuser following his death in 2011 at age 84. The once lauded BBC TV host was revealed to have been a cunning predator who used his celebrity to attack hundreds of victims, some as young as eight over the course of decades. The sickening revelations about Savile prompted a flood of similar allegations against other powerful British media figures. Police launched the sweeping Operation U-Tree probe to investigate historic claims of abuse by various prominent persons. Glitter soon found his name in the crosshairs as whispers of his misconduct turned into a roar. In October 2012, Glitter was arrested on suspicion of sexual offenses as part of the U-Tree investigation. The most shocking accusation was that he had raped a teenage girl in Savile's BBC dressing room back in the 1970s at the height of their fame. The stomach turning betrayal of trust was emblematic of how both men had leveraged their celebrity to monstrous ends. After the initial arrest, the case against Glitter steadily expanded to encompass more historic claims. In June 2014, he was formally charged with eight counts of abhorrent sexual crimes against two girls aged 12 to 14 in the late 1970s. The full scope of Glitter's offenses was finally coming to light after festering in the shadows for so many years. When Glitter's trial began in January 2015, the world watched in revulsion as the depravity of the one-time pop idol was laid bare in excruciating detail. A court heard how the singer had ruthlessly groomed and exploited vulnerable young girls who looked up to him throughout his glory years. In one particularly graphic account, prosecutors described how Glitter had lured a 12-year-old fan and her 13-year-old friend to his dressing room after a concert. He plied the star-struck girl 
girls with champagne before isolating them from their mothers and subjecting them to degrading sexual acts. Another accuser recounted a horrific attack that occurred when she was under 10 years old in 1975. She testified that Glitter had crept into her bed and tried to force himself on her, leaving the girl deeply traumatized. Prosecutors argued the warped singer had a pattern of targeting society's most defenseless members to fulfill his aberrant urges. Quote, you did all of them real and lasting damage, and you did so for no other reason than to obtain sexual gratification for yourself of a wholly improper kind, the judge told Glitter upon finding him guilty at the end of a harrowing two-week trial. In the end, Glitter was convicted of one count of attempted sexual assault, four counts of indecent assault, and one count of having sex with a girl under 13. He was acquitted on three other charges. The disgraced singer was sentenced to 16 years in prison as penalty for his indefensible violations of innocence. Glitter's public annihilation was now complete. He had gone from an adored, glittering star to perhaps the most despised man in Britain. The rock and roll singer would forever be synonymous not with his music, but with his evil acts. He had committed most of his worst offenses at the zenith of his stardom, when he was cloaked in the protective glow of mega fame. How many had turned a blind eye to his predation? It was an uncomfortable question with no easy answers. A TV drama ripped from the headlines. As the disturbing truth about Gary Glitter's myriad sex crimes against minors became a global scandal, the British public grappled with the unthinkable betrayal of trust. How could a treasured pop icon have concealed such depthless depravity? The shocking revelations demanded a painful cultural reckoning. In the fall of 2009, Britain's Channel 4 aired a provocative television drama that sought to confront the crisis of conscience head-on. Titled The Execution of Gary Glitter, the 90-minute film posed an unsettling hypothetical question. What if Britain brought back the death penalty for such revolting crimes? The drama imagines an alternate reality where Glitter is extradited back to Britain from Vietnam to stand trial as the first offender under a controversial new law targeting those who sexually abuse children. Despite fervent protests from human rights activists, the fictional Capital Crimes Act has made execution a legal penalty for the most serious assaults on minors. The film opens with Glitter defiantly proclaiming his innocence as he faces the media frenzy upon his return. However, the mounting evidence of his stomach-turning transgressions quickly erodes any hope of acquittal. Glitter grows increasingly unhinged and erratic as he grasps the severity of his predicament. Prosecutors outline how Glitter exploited his celebrity status to commit unspeakable acts in Britain and abroad. They paint him as an unrepentant monster who ruthlessly groomed and exploited starstruck young fans. Glitter's desperate attempts to delay and derail the proceedings underscore his moral bankruptcy. In the film's disturbing climax, Glitter is found guilty and sentenced to hang for his sickening offense against children. He continues to loudly protest his innocence right until the moment the noose tightens around his neck. Then his flailing body slumps as justice is served in the most literal sense. While deliberately provocative, the execution of Gary Glitter is more than cheap exploitation. The film aims to interrogate the public bloodlust that surrounds such emotive cases and question whether capital punishment is a just or effective deterrent. The drama also examines the broader cultural complicity that enabled predators like Glitter and Savile to evade consequences for so long. One scene shows a fictional home secretary blaming the permissive attitudes of the 1970s entertainment world for emboldening their behavior. Monstrous acts hid in plain sight. Though controversial, the execution of Gary Glitter successfully distills the anguished debates around punishing society's most irredeemable members. It's a primal scream of a film that channels the disgust and revulsion felt by many many Britons over such unfathomable betrayals of trust by coddled elites. While only a provocative fiction, the drama's thinly veiled wish fulfillment reflects the public's thirst for harsh retribution against glitter. A pathetic pariah. Sentenced to 16 years in prison for his depraved patterns of abuse in 2015, Glitter had to serve at least half that time before any chance at release. But even as an elderly convict, the perverted pop star could not control his darkest urges. In February 2023, Glitter was freed on probation after completing eight years behind bars. However, just one month into his heavily monitored release, the 79-year-old was hauled back to jail for 
for breaching the strict terms of his parole. Glitter reportedly accessed the dark web and looked at indecent images of minors violating his release conditions. Britain's probation service said they had no choice but to revoke his release given the severity of his actions and past crimes. There could be no leniency. Quote, protecting the public is our number one priority, a probation spokesperson told the media. Even pushing 80, Glitter was deemed too dangerous to be allowed even constrained freedom. He would have to serve out the remainder of his sentence in captivity. Glitter's nearly instantaneous re-offending underscores the unshakable nature of his warped compulsions. Since his first arrest in 1997, he's demonstrated no meaningful remorse or rehabilitation. Instead, he's left a nauseating trail of abuse and exploitation across multiple countries. Even at the height of his fame in the 70s, Glitter was likely preying upon young victims in plain sight as the world cheered him on. His entire pop career was cover for satisfying his basest desires. The wolf does not readily change. In a fittingly bleak coda, Glitter petitioned for early release again in February 2024 and was flatly denied. The parole board declared that the octogenarian sex offender posed far too grave a threat to ever see freedom again. He would remain locked away from the society he so gravely transgressed against. Quote, it's satisfied that release at this point would be unsafe for the protection of the public, the parole board said in a terse statement. It was a final rebuke for Glitter. The board saw no evidence the once mighty rocker had confronted the enormity and depravity of his offenses. Without accepting responsibility, there could be no mercy. So short of a miracle for him, Glitter will likely live out his last years irrelevant and reviled in a prison cell, forsaken by all. It's a pathetic conclusion for a man who once bound in the blinding wattage of global megastardom. For Gary Glitter, the self-destruction is complete. The singer who once enthralled millions as a cheeky, pied piper figure now provokes only visceral disgust. His towering musical accomplishments are forever tainted by his unforgivable personal depravities. The wretched saga of Glitter's rise and fall serves as a stomach-churning cautionary tale about the dangers of unchecked fame and power. For years, his chums and enablers in the British entertainment world looked the other way as he indulged in his vilest compulsions. Hiding in plain sight, he exploited his celebrity to rob countless innocents of their childhood. In the end, Glitter's outrageous stage persona was not some clever simulation of puckish provocation. The narcissist was simply playing an only slightly exaggerated version of his real self. The boundary pushing was a ruse to hide his true nature in the spotlight. He was pop excess as a mask for unchecked evil. I'm the leader. I'm the leader. I'm the leader of the gang I am. Glitter bragged in his most famous song, the chant takes on an unbelievably sinister overtone given all we now know about the man. He fancied himself a Svengali figure collecting young acolytes to gratify his perverse whims like a demented cult leader. The lyrics became a taunt. Glitter's story, while shocking, is not unique in the annals of celebrity downfalls. The entertainment industry is littered with examples of stars whose reprehensible deeds have been exposed, leading to their disgrace and ostracization. From the sexual assault allegations against Harvey Weinstein that sparked the Me Too movement, to the child abuse charges leveled against Michael Jackson, to the horrifying revelations about R. Kelly's predatory behavior, these stories serve as sobering reminders of the perils of unchecked power and the importance of holding even the most famous and talented people accountable for their misdeeds. In the end, the story of Gary Glitter is a grim reminder that no amount of talent or popularity can absolve one of the consequences of their actions. Now it's time to hear from you. How should society deal with criminals like Gary Glitter? Should their artistic legacy be erased, or can we separate the art from the person? Let us know in the comments section below.